Um, okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you about cancer-related fatigue and the way exercise can be used to manage, manage cancer-related fatigue as well as other symptoms um, in, your, in the cancer experience. So we'll get started. So first, let's define cancer-related fatigue. So we'll start off with a common definition of fatigue. And usually when people think of being fatigued or tired, uh, they're, ex they're expressing physical or mental weariness resulting from exertion. So after a long, long day's work, you might come home, you might be tired. Maybe if you've gone to the gym a couple too many times during the day, you might be tired. But cancer-related fatigue is quite different. So the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, um, has described cancer, defined cancer-related fatigue as a persistent and subjective sense of tiredness um, that cannot occur, or that can occur with cancer or cancer treatment that interferes with usual functioning. So the key word here is persistent. Okay, so we'll get into that in one moment. However, there's another definition, and there are many definitions of cancer-related fatigue. It's hopefully in the next couple of years they'll have one unified definition. However, another definition could be the perception of unusual tiredness uh, that varies in pattern and severity and has a negative impact on the ability to function uh, with people who have had or have cancer. Okay, so here again, something that should be highlighted is it's an unusual tiredness. It's more than what you'd expect from just being tired, okay? Now, the main thing that, unfortunately, these, um, these places have not really discussed properly is that cancer-related fatigue is not relieved by rest, okay? So this separates cancer-related fatigue from just your everyday daily fatigue, as well as fatigue that's seen in other um, other conditions such as uh, heart failure and even chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, so how common is this uh, phenomenon? Well, cancer-related fatigue is the most common symptom in patients with cancer and those following treatment and even survivors of cancer. Okay, so it ranges from 22 to 99 percent of, um, of the population depending on the assessment protocol as well as the population being assessed. In addition, it is also prevalent in 17 to 30% of survivors, so it does linger past the treatment, pe the treatment period. All right, so we've defined it. We kind of have an idea of when it, or where, who it happens or how, how much it happens in people. Now let's try to look at some potential causes. So the first thing that we notice is that prior to treatment, okay, before um, before any sort of radiation therapy or chemotherapy, the fatigue is present. In fact, it's one of the symptoms that causes a lot of people to go in and tell their doctor, I have, there's something wrong, I just I can't seem to, to wake up, I'm just tired. So this suggests that there's some sort of cause related directly to the tumor itself. During the treatment, cancer-related fatigue significantly increases. Okay? Radiation therapy has been shown to increase cancer-related fatigue in up to 99% of the population and at minimum, usually 70% of people undergoing radiation therapy will experience cancer-related fatigue. Furthermore, chemotherapies uh, have been shown to increase cancer-related fatigue in up to 90% of the population. So again, huge, huge increases in uh, the fatigue experienced. So there's a definitely something going on with uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy that are causing changes to these bodily systems that are regulating uh, this phenomenon. So after your treatments, Cancer-related fatigue is unfortunately shown in survivors, and this is troublesome because more and more people are now surviving cancer, and the popula or this population is getting larger, so this is becoming more and more of a problem. In fact, 17 to 30 percent of survivors have experienced cancer-related fatigue, and these numbers have also changed, and it's actually a little bit higher now. Um, in palliative care populations, it's up to 60 to 80 percent. Okay, so before we go any further, we'll just take a quick look into potential um, areas where the fatigue might be um, coming from. So first, central fatigue originates within the brain and the central nervous system. Okay, so the characteristic um, experience from central fatigue is that it extends into cognitive performance, meaning that you're, you're tired, you don't even want to think, you don't want to put pieces together. So that's, that's the main different, or the difference between central fatigue and peripheral fatigue is its extension into cognitive performance. Peripheral fatigue, as the name implies, originates in the peripheral regions, for example, in your muscle or in your glands. And this is characterized by defects in muscle contractility, 
um, as well as uh, reduction in neuromuscular transmission, meaning that those muscles aren't being activated the way that they once could. Now, little is known regarding the origins of cancer-related fatigue. It is a booming area of, uh, of research, considering its increased pre prevalence. Um, but evidence so far is suggesting that it's both central and peripheral in origin, whereas other, um, other fatigue experiences, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, has generally been thought to be from central fatigue. Now, chronic fatigue syndrome is very interesting because uh, researchers up to now have really looked at chronic fatigue syndrome as a template to see what happens um, in the cancer in what happens in cancer related fatigue so there generally has been a lot of research done in looking at the role of central fatigue or um, the fatigue within the mind in, uh, ca in cancer patients and they found, they found some pretty good evidence but now they're expanding so things are looking good all right, so I have this little spider web up here, not to be over dramatic or anything like that, but it's more or less a metaphor, just showing that, as you'll see in a moment, that all these potential factors that contribute to cancer-related fatigue are all tightly woven together. So that's good in a way, because if we can treat one, likely all the other, um, all the other factors are going to somehow reduce or else um, won't be as uh, strong as a factor in cancer-related fatigue. So we'll start with I don't know what I did here. Okay, so cancer-related fatigue at the center. So some of the factors of bodily systems that has, have been looked at and associated with cancer-related fatigue is the endocrine system. So anything that regulates hormone function. Okay, so a major hormone that's been looked at is serotonin. So here we just see different areas of the body where our endocrine system plays a role. Okay, so a lot of the serotonin um, effects have been looked at within the brain. Furthermore, the cardiovascular system has been looked at over and over again in regards to cancer patients, and now specifically in patients that are experiencing cancer-related fatigue. And they're showing that cardiovascular endurance, performance, um, capacity are all reduced in those that have cancer, but even a little bit more in those that have cancer-related fatigue. So another system is the autonomic nervous system. So these control processes that you don't even think about, like your heart rate, breathing, um, so these, this nervous system, or this part of the nervous system, is somehow affected in cancer-related fatigue. So the immune system has been uh, looked at in both chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, cardiac failure, as well as cancer. And what they're showing is that the immune system may have a really, really important role in cancer-related fatigue because it seems to be involved in the dysregulation of the endocrine system, the cardiovascular system, as well as the autonomic nervous system. So researchers and doctors are really looking at the immune system and trying to see how the immune system's working uh, in this whole cancer-related fatigue. And finally, skeletal muscle. As we can see, Arnold here is quite a display of skeletal muscle. So the difference, what, what's going on in cancer-related fatigue, in, in cancer patients, first of all, we know that uh, muscle contractions are, are not as strong as they used to be. Okay? We know that there's atrophy going on within the muscles. But now in chronic uh, cancer-related fatigue, they're showing that muscle metabolism might be compromised, meaning that there's an increase in peripheral fatigue resulting from a reduction in the muscle to provide itself energy in order to contract. So what happens? We'll get into this shortly, but we need to exercise in order to keep, sorry, in order to keep this the muscle metabolism working properly. And what happens if we don't exercise? Well, Arnold knows best, and that's what happens. <laughs> So, not exactly as it used to be. Okay, so the serotonin, as I was talking about earlier, is a hormone okay, that regulates or that can cause increase in sleepiness. Um, it also, importantly, causes a production or a sensation of reduced physical capacity. Okay? So say if we had, we'll use an exercise example. Say if you put somebody on a treadmill and you worked them for a long period of time, research suggests that serotonin might be one of the factors causing uh, the, the brain and the central nervous system to experience fatigue. Okay, so what we see in this diagram here, a concentration and then a timeline. Okay, so in the black dots, we see men with chronic fatigue syndrome. With the white dots, we see healthy controls. Okay, so they took blood samples from zero, or time point zero, one hours, two hours, three hours, four hours, and at two hours, they introduced some sort of stress. It's not really too important, but it, it was exer an exercise stress. And they showed that in the men with chronic fatigue syndrome, 
serotonin just skyrockets compared to the controls. So this suggests that in chronic fatigue syndrome, sort of the, the template that they've used or they've based a lot of the research off in cancer-related fatigue has some sort of role in uh, causing a fatigue within the brain. Okay, so the immune system, as I said earlier, plays a huge role in uh, cancer-related fatigue. This is a very, very good uh, paper by Alex or Alexander et al. in 2009. And what they showed, they, first of all, they took cancer patients with cancer-related fatigue, then they took cancer patients without cancer-related fatigue. Now, this is the only study that has actually done this. So this really gets you to look at differences between these populations apart from the cancer and trying to see what the fatigue is actually all about. And what they show is that in participants, um, in participants with cancer-related fatigue, there's a significantly increased level of white blood cells. Okay, so you'd, accept, uh, you'd expect an increase in white blood cells in cancer patients, okay? But in the, chronic fat or the cancer related fatigue group, it's significantly increased. Again, the neutrophils, another uh, immune cell, is significantly higher in the patients with cancer related fatigue versus those without cancer related fatigue. And inflammation, as uh, indicated by C-reactive protein, which is just a marker that they use to describe inflammation, is also significantly higher in uh, populations with, or cancer patients with cancer-related fatigue compared to those that do not have cancer-related fatigue. So this is very important because it really shows the, the importance of the immune system in cancer-related fatigue. Okay, so this is the, the area that um, we'll be looking a little bit more into today. Uh, relating to physical capacity, aerobic fitness, and uh, muscular endurance, and stuff like that, because those are the kind of things that we can see almost immediate effects with exercise. Okay, so first, those with cancer have shown that fatigue is negatively correlated with aerobic capacity, or work, in, this, in this case here, workload. So that means that as fatigue goes up, your aerobic capacity seems to go down. Okay, so there's some sort of relationship, whether it's a cause, probably not directly, but there is a relationship there, so it's worth investigating. Also, muscle force um, and muscle, um, so upper, upper body force, this was measured through a bench press, and then lower body force was measured through a leg press. So we could see that maximal workload, as well as the individual areas of muscles, are compromised uh, in patients with cancer-related fatigue, or they're related to cancer-related fatigue. So again, um, this time looking at VO2 max, which is the amount of oxygen your body could use. It's a great indicator of how, how fit your aerobic system is. Okay, we can see that, again, there's a negative correlation here, suggesting that as, your, your, as cancer-related fatigue goes up, there is a reduction in your aerobic performance. What's really interesting here, though, is that other symptoms, such as depression, um, anxiety, anger, hostility, those are all positively correlated with cancer-related fatigue and quite strongly related actually. And this means that as your fatigue goes up, these other symptoms are also going to go up, okay? So this is what um, has been referred to as a symptom cluster. And this is important because if you can treat one of those symptoms within that cluster, the other one should, should theoretically go down. Okay, so now onto the, the good stuff. So can exercise influence these systems that are related to cancer-related fatigue? All right, so here we have Lance Armstrong. I'm sure everybody has heard, heard from him, but he trains a lot, okay? He trains tons. So he's obviously got other systems that are very, very strong, but one of the systems might be that serotonin regulation. And one of the studies that's quite interesting is they looked at animals um, and they trained them, okay? So these are just resting levels in the black of serotonin within different brain regions. Now remember serotonin, a high level of serotonin can cause sleepiness, as well as that perceived, or that perception that you just, you don't have the gusto to get up and do something or perform physical activity. Okay, so what we see is that in these light gray bars, which were the trained animals, at rest, they're much lower. So the level of serotonin within these brain, brain regions are much lower in the trained animals, suggesting that Training does have uh, some sort of effect in reducing serotonin in the brain, theoretically reducing fatigue caused by this factor. What's really interesting is that if you stimulate the system to try, or you, you try to get the system to fatigue, you could actually keep that reduction down, or keep that, uh, that serotonin level down 
after you've exer exercised or during exercise, which suggests that during, throughout the day, if you're moving around exercising, this increase in serotonin might not be as, uh, might not be as dramatic as if you were to not exercise. Okay, so again, talking about the immune system here. So exercise has uh, shown, been shown time and time again to influence the immune system. Okay, in this study here, they looked at the effects of exercise training in uh, immune cell activation as well as inflammation. Now, active immune cells are going to stimulate inflammation in certain areas, um, basically as a signaling mechanism to get more inflammatory cells in there to help heal that tissue. The problem is sometimes is that it's overactive and these, this overactivity can cause a lot of detrimental effects to other systems such as the skeletal muscle. So in this one here, we have the percent of activated immune cells here. And then this is uh, pre-treatment or pre-exercise and post-exercise. And then in the black bars, we have a physically inactive group. And then in the white bars, they have a physically active group. Okay, so right off the bat, they're just comparing physically inactive versus physically active. And what you can see is that the amount of immune cells or the, act, the amount of active immune cells is much higher in those that do not participate in uh, regular physical activity. Now, after you exercise both of these groups in the post here, you can see that the physically inactive group definitely has a much lower level of uh, chronically activated immune cells. Now you might be thinking, well, your immune cells are important, and absolutely they are, but there's another, um, another figure that I didn't put on here, uh, just for time, uh, for considering time, but what it shows is that when you stimulate, stimulate these immune cells, they respond even stronger after exercise. So the level of chronic in, infl or inflammation might go down, but you could still get the proper activation of these immune cells when they're needed. Okay, so again, looking at inflammation. Um, TNF-alpha is an inflammatory marker, so it's basically uh, a signal that's going to um, have a bunch of, or a variety of different effects in different, um, different tissues. For example, we'll use muscle, because I have a picture of it here. Um, but in muscle, TNF-alpha has been shown to alter metabolic properties. So supp to suppress uh, metabolism in, or certain types of metabolism in skeletal muscle. It's also been shown to cause uh, atrophy of that muscle by activating a lot of processes that basically cut up your muscles from the inside and then allow them to shrink. Okay? So what we see here is that within the blood, this inflammatory factor is much higher pre before exercise, and then following exercise, it's reduced. Okay? So again, suggesting that there's a reduction in inflammation. I can't really appreciate it in this picture here uh, with the projector, but this panel A um, is much, it should be much darker than panel B, and that's again just showing the baseline level of TNF alpha within the muscle, and then following an exercise training um, program. Okay, so moving on to some cardiovascular benefits. We all know that exercise has a great and a, and a positive impact on. Um, cardiovascular um, endurance as well as other other systems related to um, the heart and vasculature. So first we'll look at what we found here, what uh, Pinto found. They show that the exercise group prior to treatment, now these are cancer patients, cancer patients, breast cancer patients, um, they show that their base systolic blood pressure is much higher before exercise and following. So there's a, there's a significant reduction in your blood pressure following exercise. Now this has been shown a lot of times, usually in cardiac patients, but this is just showing that it does have a beneficial effect also in cancer patients. So your diastolic blood pressure, which is very important because that's the pressure on your heart at rest, um, also significantly reduces uh, falling exercise training. Yep. How are you defining exercise? Okay, so the exercise in this group was an aerobic exercise. So they did, um, the Pinto's study, they did uh, 12 weeks of aerobic exercise and then the, I forget the exact intensities, but we'll go over exercise prescription shortly after, but it was an aerobic exercise program for 12 weeks. Okay. okay, so again, now this was at baseline. So this is as soon as they came in to the, uh, to the gym or to the clinic, this is what they took. Now putting somebody uh, on a bike or giving them some sort of exercise stress is important because that shows whether or not 
if once they leave the clinic and they're not sitting down, if they have to go carry groceries or walk to the, the, the corner store, they're exercising and they want to make sure that your cardiovascular system is strong while you're performing these activities of daily living. So what they did was they took a group and they added some resistance uh, to a bicycle and then they made them exercise and what they show is that systolic blood pressure as well as diastolic blood pressure is much lower even after exercise or even during exercise sorry as well as the heart rate significantly reduced also meaning that there's less stress on the heart and the cardiovascular system following an aerobic exercise program in cancer patients okay so again looking at some aerobic exercise now this is a great study because they don't not only show the effects of an, ex an aerobic exercise training program um, and sorry they don't only just show the effects right away or after the training program but they also show some detraining effects so it really solidifies the importance of exercise and maintaining uh, proper cardiovascular function so VO2 max or VO2 peak here I'm sorry if I didn't define it but is the maximum capacity that your body is able to transport and utilize oxygen so you need oxygen for your muscles to make to convert everything into energy without the oxygen your your muscles don't work as well and they fatigue much faster so the increase in VO2 usually means a stronger cardiovascular system okay uh, PPO is peak power output so the amount of watts that the individual is able to push out in their exercise so what we see here is prior to training um, there these are prior to training marks as well as post training marks were significantly higher so your VO2 increased by three or 2.3 points which is pretty good um, again the the peak power output was significantly higher as well so you're able to exert more force okay so this is important now what happens if you don't train or you don't maintain this training you lose a lot of these effects okay so you're going to lose your VO2 max or uh, your your original or post exercise VO2 max you're going to lose that ability to push as much as you used to be able to okay so once you engage in a physical activity you really got to keep it up or else you, you will lose it okay so looking at now a resistance training program okay so in 2010 um, in a great journal here clinical journal of oncology uh, Daniel Gavlo or Galvo uh, he, he used a, a, a combined resistance and aerobic training program okay, and what they found was that using the combination of the two they get really really interesting results um, sometimes stronger than just using aerobic or resistance training on its own it's they show here that's a really good idea to use both so for example in the exercise group at uh, before the exercise program chest press was 34 kilograms following 12 weeks of the exercise prescription they had an increase in about four four kilograms to their bench press which was very good okay again leg press was uh, quite phenomenal with a 98 prior to the exercise and then up to 134 kilograms okay so that's those are great results so um, this just shows that aerobic exercise does work and when you start adding a little bit of resistance training to it as well it really makes really makes a nice effect this group here did a couple different exercises so in their exercise the one problem with the cancer related fatigue literature is that they don't really give you a lot of their exercise prescription um, it's unfortunate but that's kind of the way it goes but in this paper they did do they did mention uh, walking um, they had some participants uh, they said that it was safe for some participants to start running and stuff like that or they're jogging um, they had a couple they mentioned it a couple times that there was also biking involved so um, it really it depends on your preference really and what what uh, what you can do what you feel comfortable with doing um, but biking walking and jogging are usually the most common the resistance training was twice a week yeah so it was twice a week so they had um, they started in this program here they started with twice a week so they did a short short aerobics and then some resistance training twice a week and then as the weeks progressed they increased the volume so they increased the amount of aerobic activity um, by not not increasing the how hard it is but increasing the, the number of days in which you did it so I think by the end they're looking at about five days per week so you really you just work your way up um, so yeah, so the max strength is important because it just shows you how much you can lift once. But really, you're probably not going to do too much of that in a day. You're going to be working at a submaximal level. So you want to see how how much uh, endurance your muscles have. So what these guys have done is they've also tested muscular endurance. So they took a submaximal amount of weight, 
and they saw how many times they could lift it. So for the uh, chest press, or the bench press, well, that's handy. Um, for the chest press, they did, say, 10 or 11 kilograms. Um, 11 kilograms, sorry, or sorry, 70% of their 1RM, so that's relative to, to whatever they did at the, the baseline or before they started the program. And then following their exercise prescriptions, they were able to increase their reps by 16, 15 to 16. So that's, that's really good. That means that you can, you can walk a little bit longer, you can lift things a little bit longer, more time. So those are, those are really gonna help out with activities of daily living. Okay. Also leg press was also increased. Again, we saw a dramatic increase here with the leg press and the maximum um, lifts, but you also see a huge increase in the amount of times you can lift a submaximal weight. Okay, so again, increased walk distance, increased getting up, standing up, all those kind of things. All right, so cancer-related fatigue has only recently got a lot of attention, but there are only very, very, or there's only very few um, studies that have actually looked at how it's been managed in the past. So these are, luckily I found one, um, and here we show that generally nothing was recommended for cancer patients who came in and discussed with their physician about fatigue. Like this is something that's bothering them, but there was really no recommendation. This is likely because there wasn't very much research into this area at the, at the time. Now, rest and relaxation was also another thing that was very, very important or very um, highly recommended. As we saw earlier in the first couple slides is that this is probably not the best thing to do. In fact, probably the worst thing to do. Okay, so cancer-related fatigue is not relieved by rest, yet 37% of the recommendations were to give people rest. Okay, so then we go through diet, nutrition, vitamins, prescription drugs, and exercise down here. So kind of the, nobody really thought exercise would work, and can't really blame them. When you think of exercise, you think of working out and getting really tired afterwards. So if you're already tired, why would you want to do that, right? It's kind of counterintuitive. However, we'll talk about this very shortly. Okay, so with those recommendations given to that population, we see that that population was still not very comfortable with walking long distances, cleaning the house, general house cleaning chores. So just these basic activities of daily living again have been, are perceived to be much more uh, difficult to do following the recommendations that were given. Okay, so again, generally nothing was recommended. Rest and relaxation was the second most commonly recommended um, and exercise wasn't considered very important. Now, keeping in mind this is data from the year 2000, so that's it's pretty outdated, but this was the only paper that I can find that talked about this, and I think it's an important point. All right, so now we'll get into the, the way exercise, or if exercise can, in fact, manage cancer-related fatigue. So can exercise offer acute relief from cancer-related fatigue, so on a day-by-day -day basis? Um, does exercise improve fatigue for not only, say, a breast cancer patient, but also for prostate cancer patients? Okay. Um, now, again, there's a lot of um, a, there's a, a bunch, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of research suggesting that it does work in a multitude of different populations. Okay. What I've chosen to show here was just because they're out of uh, really strong journals and they're also included in my, some of my thesis work. So, if uh, I've left any um, cancer site out, just let me know and. Um, I can, I can talk to you about that also. Okay. Um, and then we're going to follow up with looking at what are the best exercise prescriptions. So getting again at the point of what types of exercises work best, when we should be prescribing them, okay, and any, um, any confounding factors or contraindications that might limit people from doing exercise. All right, so in this study here, the authors were looking at daily fatigue Okay, and women with breast cancer receiving chemotherapy. Right, as I mentioned before, chemotherapy or patients undergoing chemotherapy have huge increases in fatigue. Right, so these guys wanted to find out whether or not exercise can have an acute effect in relieving some of these symptoms uh, related to cancer-related fatigue. So what they found is that on days where patients did not exercise, 50% of them experienced the worst amount of cancer or worst amount of fatigue that day. Okay. Whereas on the days where they did exercise, only 46% experienced can, or fatigue during that day. So this suggests that exercise can relieve fatigue immediately. Right? Also, fatigue now, just at the time when they walked in, and then the average fatigue throughout the day. 
Okay, so again, the exercise group did show a, a quite a large reduction in the amount of fatigue experienced in that day. And so I found this little study here was quite interesting because they didn't do a lot of statistics. They just looked at the perceptions and looked at what people said, um, which is very, very important, okay, because these are, these are real people here, not, not just uh, interpretations of numbers. So this one participant, 40-year-old woman with breast cancer, following an exercise program said, I thought that at first, um, all I did, uh, all, I'd just feel awful afterwards, you know, because I'd be exhausted. But I did perhaps the first couple of times. Now I'm feeling that it does make me feel more rejuvenated and a bit more energy, or a bit more ener energy. So she's generally feeling that after the exercise, she does feel a little bit more rejuvenated. Okay, so that's a key word in there. And she does have more energy. And again, we can see that it's very similar in this participant and this participant. Uh, where they show that um, they feel quite poorly before the exercise, but then afterwards, after they've done a little bit of exercise, it perks them up, uh, gives them a little bit more energy. Okay, so and it, here again, bucks yourself up. So suggesting that following an exercise, or participating in exercise, really does help alleviate some of that fatigue that you might have been experiencing before. Okay, so that answers the first question. So yeah, exercise can offer some acute relief from fatigue. Um, now, does exercise improve fatigue in a variety of different patients and following different treatments? So unfortunately, again, I don't have uh, a comprehensive list here. I just have a couple examples, but again, I'll, I'm definitely willing to talk to you about them afterwards if you'd like. So in breast cancer patients receiving adjuvant therapies, um, a lot of data suggests that up to 30%, you can see up to 30% improvements in aerobic performance. Um, now, these are a variety of different studies. Now, so it's not specifically any one type of exercise that they're using, but in general, you could get up to a 30% improvement in aerobic performance, as well as up to a 15% increase in muscle strength and endurance. All right. So what about cancer-related fatigue? Again, the same general population, breast cancer patients receiving adjuvant therapies. Um, Anna Campbell and her group found that exercise, let's look at this one down here, the exercise group was able to increase their FACT G scores, which is a cancer-related fatigue dies, or, um, assessment form, by 11 or almost 12 points, which is very important. Like that, that's a very large increase. Okay. Um, now they show an increase here. They do show an increase here um, in the FACT B um, assessment, which is just another assessment form that is commonly used. It didn't reach statistical significance, but it did increase quite substantially, so I mean, user discretion there. Okay, so this shows that um, small group, that's why they call it a pilot study, that supervised exercise uh, was very effective in reducing uh, cancer-related fatigue in this population. Okay, so what about in breast cancer patients following adjuvant therapies? Well, again, we see, uh, commonly see an increase in aerobic fitness, up to 30%. And in muscular strength, this is quite interesting, up to a 60% increase. Okay? So this is a, quite a significant effect. But what about cancer-related fatigue? Okay, so same population after treatment. Um, Carol Schneider looked at a variety of different types of fatigue or cause or origins of fatigue, so behavioral fatigue, affective, sensory, cognitive, as well as total fatigue. We'll just focus on total fatigue. Um, and they showed that during treatment in... Um, in good, or, uh, as shown previously, there is a positive influence. So, in this, sorry, in this, di they use the uh, a different cancer fatigue assessment form, which makes things a little bit confusing because a reduction in the numbers on this form indicate a reduction of fatigue. Okay, so that's why it's a little the opposite direction in this one here. But they did show a reduction, a significant reduction uh, during treatment, but also following treatment, they saw even uh, a greater effect. So slightly greater reduction in cancer-related fatigue. Okay, so prostate cancer is another, another one that's commonly mentioned in the literature. And again, we'll, let's take a look at those undergoing adjuvant therapies. So we see that um, aerobic fitness can go up to, up to 20%. Uh, muscular strength and endurance has also been shown to go up to 40%. Now in this population, there is um, a lot of the literature looks at resistance training, and I think that's probably why we see a little bit more of an increase compared to some other, other populations. So uh, with cancer-related fatigue, however, we do see 
um, that on, on two scales, so the fatigue scale as well as the fact p scale, um, a reduction in cancer-related fatigue. So pretest score of 40, or say 41 for the intervention group, and a little bit higher for the control group. Following the test, we see a significant reduction, or uh, sorry, a reduction in the uh, control group, and then a significant reduction in the intervention group. Okay, so just suggesting again that on this scale, it does cause a reduction, or this exercise program that they used here, a resistance training program, causes a significant reduction in their fatigue. Now on the fact p scale, which is slightly different, um, they also show the same results. So this is very important using a couple different assessments because it's one of the, one of the limitations in the, the literature that everybody's reading is that certain forms are slightly different um, and they give different results. So it's good to, that these guys showed um, different, different scores from different, um, different scales. So in this one here, they see that the intervention group started at, say, 118. And then following exercise, a resistance exercise, it increased two points, and that was indeed significant. Okay? The majority of the research that I've looked at, um, well, I can't really say the majority, but there's a lot um, in Europe, in uh, Germany. So a ton in Germany. There's uh, about three scientists in Germany that do a lot of work in this area. Um, there's actually a few in uh, Alberta that are probably in the top, top level of uh, researchers for this area. And then there's a couple down in the, in the States. So it's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, but in Europe, most of the, the research that I've looked at has come out of Germany. And then uh, a, little bit from, a little bit from Ottawa and a lot from Alberta. And then a couple labs in the state. All right, so this study just basically shows that resistance training does have a beneficial effect on fatigue in populations with prostate cancer um, undergoing androgen deprivation therapies. Okay, so as far as um, specific exercise or specific cancer types, that's all I'm going to present. Um, definitely be willing again to ask or answer questions regarding other cancer types. Um, but this group here, um, I believe they're from Germany. Um, let's see, yeah. So they, they, did, uh, they did a lot of research on uh, heterogeneous groups of cancer patients. So cancer patients with solid tumors, Hodgkin's disease, a variety of different tumor, sort or tumor sites. All right, so this is something that you'd probably see in a, in a cancer, cancer care program or in a, an exercise program. So they're gonna, they wanted to see whether or not overall exercise could affect or have a beneficial effect on fatigue in a, a diverse group of cancer patients. Also, a lot of them were undergoing um, different types of treatments. So I'd say quite a few of them were done treatments. However, a lot of them still were currently taking treatments. All right, so what they show here is that physical fatigue is uh, indicated here. So pre-exercise was signif significantly reduced following the exercise intervention. Okay, psychological fatigue or mental fatigue was again significantly reduced following the intervention. And then uh, cognitive fatigue wasn't quite significantly reduced, but it was, it was reduced compared to uh, before they, they started an exercise program. Okay, so this data has not been published yet, and uh, it's some really exciting data that uh, Dr. Newhouse has been working on. Um, and so I'm really happy that I can present a little bit of it here today. So they used a home-based exercise program in a heterogeneous group of cancer patients. And they showed that there was a significant increase in the six-minute walk test, so uh, an indicator of aerobic function. Okay, so that's a great result. Again, they show chair, uh, chair stand test, which is basically repeatedly up and down out of chairs significant um, amount of squats performed, okay? So that's, again, a great result. So these, these two here, I'll go back, these two here are a really good test to use to infer some sort of uh, training effect on things you do in your, your daily life. So just getting up and out of your car, in and out of the house, walking around at work or wherever you may be. So we, they show both a significant effect in both these tests, which is wonderful. So with the fatigue, they show a massive reduction here. This is a, a, almost half, actually probably a little bit more half in the BFI or the brief fatigue inventory. And then the FACT F has a variety of different classifications. But as you can see, post-exercise, the, post there's an increase in physical well-being. Social well-being is higher. Emotional well-being is slightly higher. Um, fun functional well-being, again, is quite higher. And the fatigue subscale, you see a a marked, or a marked increase in this number. Okay, so one of the ways that we can really 
um, look at the data um, from a large, a, a greater perspective is by taking a number of different studies and combining them all together to see if there is a, a positive effect when looking at not only one study but hundred, hundreds of other studies. Now, I'd like to say hundreds of other studies, but stuff that I was able to do uh, due to quality, we try to make sure that the quality was very uh, high quality in these papers. We were only able to get 22 paper, 22 studies or independent studies, but of these 22 independent high quality studies, we see that everything, or we'll first show that everything on this side of this line was a beneficial effect of exercise in cancer or for cancer related fatigue. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it was significant statistically, it's just was it better or was it worse? And we see that every single study that was shown here had a good outcome. Okay? So some were greater than others. Um, reasons for that, I'm not too sure. But, but the take home message is that every single study showed a beneficial effect of exercise on cancer related fatigue. Okay, so now we wanted to try to figure out why they weren't all at the same, the same level. Okay, so as again, we show that cancer-related fatigue um, was significantly reduced, so there's a, a moderate effect, okay, which is good. And then um, the aerobic exercise interventions show probably the most significant effect, okay, but this, keep in mind, was likely because of the higher number of exercise interventions used in the analysis. Um, that being said, there were beneficial effects of resistance uh, exercise programs and aerobic resistance training. Okay, so all three of these exercise, um, or this type of exercise prescription showed beneficial effects. During treatment, we see um, a moderate effect, significant moderate effect, and then following treatment, we see a little bit of a stronger effect. So with this, as well as looking at some of the literature that was included in this analysis, it really basically shows that during treatments, cancer-related fatigue can be significantly reduced. However, if it doesn't become significantly reduced, it doesn't get worse. Okay? And then that sets you up for following the treatment, you're at a better, better state. You can start exercising and your, your treatments or your exercise prescription should work very nicely. Now because of the, the high number of breast cancer studies out there, um, we are only able to group breast cancer together and then group all the other cancers to, uh, other, all the other cancer types together. So we see that in both breast cancer and all the other ones, um, there were significant reductions in cancer-related fatigue, okay, and quite a large reduction in breast cancer. Now supervised, looking at more of an exercise prescription, where should you exercise? The super, uh, supervised exercise showed the greatest effect, okay, but that being said, the unsupervised or home-based exercise did show a positive effect. There was just less of them. And I'm sure that if there's more studies done on this, then this would have reached uh, statistical significance. Now looking at aerobic and musculoskeletal function, we see that there's a huge increase or a massive, uh, sorry, I'll just say a very strong increase in aerobic performance and also again a very strong increase in musculoskeletal performance. Okay, so to answer that question originally that we stated, does exercise improve fatigue for patients and survivors with different cancers and treatment types? And the answer is yes. All right, so now let's get into a little bit more of a, the technical stuff, I guess, with the, the exercise prescriptions, and we'll, we'll see what, what exercises are being used and, and uh, how we should properly prescribe the exercises. So the first thing we need to consider when trying to make a, an exercise program um, to make sure that it, it, it maximizes its effects. Let's look at the location. So again, studies have shown that home-based exercises are quite effective. They do provide positive results. And as well, uh, exercises in uh, fitness facilities or in a supervised setting provide positive results, maybe slightly, slightly greater than the home-based exercises. So this is just confirmed by a study done, uh, another meta-analysis done here where they show that the home-based exercises, these ones here, were again on this side of the line, showing that it was a beneficial effect, and here's the average effect. But the supervised aerobic exercises that were done showed a little bit higher of a, a little bit greater of an effect, suggesting, suggesting that the cancer-related fatigue was reduced a little bit more in the supervised aerobic exercise. Okay, so a couple of things that might contribute to this are those um, social interactions and other 
and other things that you, you get out of a supervised um, exercise prescription versus the home-based ones where you can have friends come over and everything like that, but this kind of gets you up and gets you out and engages you a little bit more socially than as if you're to do it at home. Okay, so another thing we need to look at is when do we begin exercising? Well, according to a recent study um, just put out by the American College of Sports Medicine, they suggest that it's never too early or it's never too late. So here they've sort of put up a little bit of a timeline, and here they've, they've sectioned it off into different, um, different time points. Okay, and up here, they show the, the target of exercise. What should we be doing in our exercise prescriptions? What should we be trying to uh, attain? So there's a lot of data that, that's out there that suggests that exercise can prevent a number of different cancers. Okay, so prior to diagnosis, that should be the main goal. Um, detection, screening, Okay, we also, following diagnosis, um, exercise should be aimed at treatments and preparing um, the, the subject for the treatments and coping with the treatments. Uh, so that's, and then the treatments here, you, wanna, you want exercise should be used to maybe manage the fatigue so that patients could continue on with their treatments. A couple of studies that I've looked at that were actually mentioned in here suggest in the, the later parts of their paper that the participants that were in the exercise groups completed more of their treatments than the ones that were not in the exercise groups. So that's definitely going to have a benefit when it comes to getting rid of the cancer. Um, also, following the treatments, that's when we're seeing maybe some of the, be the, the greater results uh, from exercise programs, and that's um, basically looking at recovery and rehabilitation. Okay? And then disease prevention after the tumor is gone, and then palliation, and then survival. All right, so the main thing about the exercise prescription is that it has to be individualized. Okay? We're all very different, and ty different types of exercise have very different effects on the individual as well as different systems in your body. So putting together some of the things that we know might be related to cancer-related fatigue, we should really try to target the type of exercise towards those causes or those potential causes of cancer-related fatigue. Okay, so first we'll take just a brief look at some exercise testing and initial uh, assessments. Okay, so first, first thing that should be done is just a general medical assessment um, before the exercise begins. So that's just looking at or evaluating any peripheral neuropathies, uh, musculoskeletal dysfunction, uh, risks of fracture, as well as cardiovascular conditions that might arise. Okay, site-specific medical um, assessments, looking at range of motion, um, looking for signs of lymphedema, that is a big one. Um, and also, especially with lymphedema, before you start exercising the upper body. Okay, so just site-specific type of concerns that you want to look at. Again, you want to evaluate muscle strength and wasting. Um, a good example of a group that's affected highly by this is in prostate cancer patients. Okay, so you want to look at the strength of their muscles, body composition, before you start exercising. Resistance uh, to infection is a big one, because a lot of these therapies really suppress the immune system. Um, and going out into a supervised setting or even into a pool can have some pretty negative effects. Okay, so when we're doing our exercise testing, um, generally uh, in that one paper um, published by the American College of Sports Medicine, they suggest that exercise testing does not need to be done prior to very low intensity walking, flexibility, or um, resistance training programs. Okay, these are things that you could be able to do without undergoing certain types of exercise tests. However, at higher intensities, um, uh, ACSM suggests to use their guidelines. So if the exercise specialists in the room, they're probably pretty familiar with these. So it's nothing too different, but there is a section within, the, within their manual that says what to do. Um, and then the mode of exercise and the intensity should be based off of these results. Right? Just to make sure, again, that these results or um, their exercise prescriptions are made for them and what they can do, and that's when you're going to see the best effect. All right, so I have a couple of case studies that were pulled out of uh, a paper by Schneider, which we presented earlier. So this is in a, a heterogeneous group of uh, cancer patients, so Jane. So Jane uh, had breast cancer, All right, so she was 55, one year, or 50, 51 years old. There's some heart rate, 91 beats per minute, okay, so um, original fatigue score. All right, so she had um, mastectomy. So these are just the brief history, the things that you should be aware of before you do an exercise prescription. 
Here's some results from her cardiac assessment or cardiovascular assessment result. So she used a Bruce treadmill test, which uh, sometimes might be uh, a little bit too, too intense for some, some people. So there are a variety of other protocols, but this one has been used quite often. Um, so these are just the results. So our fitness category is generally pretty low. So these are some physical um, and medical concerns. I won't go too much into these, but um, just things like when or what, the way her treatments are going to be laid out. So she's doing radiation follow or will follow the chemotherapy. Um, where any surgery was performed. These are very important things to look at um, just to help you to prescribe your exercise and make sure that it's safe. Okay, so this is just a general outline of what her prescription would look like. So with the aerobics, she is going to work between 40 and 42% of her heart rate reserve, so her cardiovascular um, strength. She's going to be working within that percentage, uh, which works out to be 122 to 124 beats per minute. So those, that's the range that you'd like to stay within as prescribed here. If you do not have a heart rate uh, monitor, or if you, your heart rate monitor is, say, messing up a little bit and you can't trust its readings, Things like the, the um, rate of perceived exertion is a, an important tool and is also an effective tool to use. So out of 10, you want to be working at a level two. Okay, so just very minimal, low intensity exercise. Um, she's going to be working for two days a week. Okay? And then 10 minutes, um, aerobic exercises will last a duration of 10 minutes. She's also going to be doing strength and endurance exercises. So using here, she's using light free weights also resistant, resistance bands. She's going to be doing this two times a week. She's going to be doing one set of the exercises with 10 repetitions. And uh, similar to the aerobic exercise, she's going to be doing it at a rate of perceived exertion of two. So nothing too, too heavy. She's going to focus on bilateral strength. And she's going to perform her exercises unilaterally okay, with light, free weights, resistance bands, as mentioned up here. Um, Okay, so this is what her prescription would look like in the, uh, in the paper. So her warm-up consisted of a walking, just walking on a treadmill, low speed, 1.7 miles per hour, at a low grade, so 0.5% for 5 to 10 minutes, just until she feels ready to go. And then aerobic activity was walking on, a, walking on the treadmill at the, the same um, speed. However, they increased the intensity by increasing the, the grade. So it's just a little bit more difficult to walk. Um, and they did this for 10 minutes. Her resistance activities included a bench press, a one-arm lateral roll. That's where you bring the arm up and you just pull it back. Um, a front raise is where you're raising up your shoulders. Uh, bicep, or bicep curl, tricep kickbacks, wall squats, okay, uh, calf raises and crunches. So very, very um, common exercises that you see a lot of people doing within the gym. Okay, so then the cool down stretch. The cool down stretch was followed uh, followed this entire program, and they just did a 10-minute very light walk, what they perceived as light. Um, as suggested, again, that was at a 5% grade, maybe even a little bit slower than their warm-up walk. Um, and then they stretched the major, major muscle groups used. So they ch or, um, stretched chest muscles, lat muscles, or latissimus muscles, um, their shoulders, biceps, triceps, uh, quadriceps, and hamstrings, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so here's a second case study. This is for John. Now, he has prostate cancer. Um, he's done his adjuvant therapies, so he's all finished. Now, his Bruce treadmill, um, Bruce treadmill test was, again, he puts him in the fitness category of relatively low. Um, so he's had, or this is his uh, medical history, his concerns here. So he pres uh, presents with persistent fatigue. He did have a surgery uh, to repair the meniscus in his left knee. Okay, so that's going to provide a little bit of a stick, stick here to, to work your prescriptions around. So these are the small little things that you need. Well, maybe not so much small, but little details that you really need to pay attention to because this might limit or uh, reduce the, the amount of comfort that certain exercises are going to have for him. OK, so general outline of his prescription. He's going to be working at a similar intensity as uh, Jane, working at 40 to 45% of his heart rate reserve. Now, it looks on numbers the same as the one previous, but this is based off of his score on his exercise test. Okay, so this is all relative to the individual, um, which works out to 114 to 117 beats per minute. And he's going to be working at a little bit higher intensity, so rate of perceived exertion of three. And he's going to be doing 
um, this program for three days a week, 20 minutes a day, okay? Or 20 minute durations. So for his strength and endurance exercises, he's gonna be using resistance bands and weight machines. Um, uh, weight machines are, are great exercises just to develop that motor pattern and get your, your body used to a specific movement that it might not usually be used to. Okay, so his warm-up consisted of the aqua cruiser, which is just a, a water-based exercise because, again, he has that, that uh, meniscus repair. So he's going to try to reduce the load on that knee. So he's doing some water exercises. For his aerobic activity, he's going to be doing 20 minutes in total, and he's going to be walking again on the aqua cruiser for five minutes at uh, 1.3 miles per hour, 10 minutes for a little bit faster speed, make it a little bit harder for him, and then five minutes for 1.3 miles per hour. So everything, this is what he can handle, and this is what's going to work for him, okay? So his resistance activities, he has a lot of them. So he's doing chest press, shoulder press, front raise, uh, shoulder internal and external rotation, so that's just holding the weight at your sides and rotating your, your elbows basically in and out. Uh, lat pull downs, single arm bell or dumbbell curls, and then overhead extensions. And he's also got sit or step ups, which are commonly used in different knee injuries to help rehabilitate the knee. He's going to be doing hamstring curls, standing calf raises, and then because of his uh, where his site of his cancer, he's going to be doing a variety of different motions on the exercise ball um, using different pelvic tilts. Then he's going to be doing crunches on that same exercise ball. Okay, so a variety of different exercises. I've been prescribed, and this is based off of his comfort, his level of comfort, and uh, what, he, what he's interested in doing. All right, so his cool down is going to be 10 minutes long, and in, just like the one before, he's going to be trying to stretch out all those major muscles that he used during his exercise. All right, so that's going to pretty much wrap things up. So out of this presentation, I hope that everybody got that uh, cancer-related fatigue is not uh, relieved by rest. Okay, so that's very, very important. Um, so sitting down and just resting and thinking that it's going to go away is probably not going to be the best way to go about things. Um, exercise has been shown to alter the suggested biological mechanisms contributing to cancer related fatigue and also not shown here there are um, studies that show that exercise can reduce other symptoms such as depression and anxiety in cancer patients. And exercise has been shown over and over again to be an effective way to manage cancer related fatigue. Uh, in our study, we looked at over, initially there was over um, 600 papers on this topic. Only 22 of them were sufficient quality to be entered into our analysis, but there is a lot of research being done, and a lot of this research is showing very positive results with uh, very few um, incidences, and meaning that it's quite safe to do. Um, exercise, in order for it to be uh, most effective, you need to prescribe it to the individual. Okay? Um, so in order to do this, you must first consult your physician to look at any limitations and any uh, existing health concerns, um, and well, as well as looking, at, uh, looking to an exercise specialist to help you prescribe exercises that are going to be beneficial to you um, at an intensity that you're comfortable with, but at, at the same time, we're still going to allow to produce those adaptations and uh, beneficial results. Okay, so there's a final thought. Seems pretty clear that... Uh, what they need to do to improve their health is just exercise. So, thank you.